Ladies and gentlemen, it is Oktoberfest season, which means that it's the time of year where it's acceptable to drink entire liters of beer in the middle of the day. And also we're going to be brewing today. We are making a Fest beer, which is the Oktoberfest beer that is consumed in Germany at Oktoberfests. This right here is a Märzen, which I just brewed a couple weeks ago. It is the traditional Oktoberfest beer, and it's what most Americans know to be Oktoberfest beer. But the Fest beer is still quite a good beer, quite a unique beer, and something that is worth brewing this time of year. It's very similar in construction to a Helles Lager. It's not very hoppy, but it has some hop character. Compared to this Märzen here, it's a much more pale beer. It's a a little bit darker than your typical like Pilsner or maybe even Helles Lager. It's got some color variation there. It's got a little bit more hop character than this guy. It's got a little less caramel character than this guy, but it's still got some rich maltiness to it. And it's a very consumable lager. Still comes in around five and a half to six and a half percent though. So it's a little bit stronger than your typical German lager. At the end of the day though, we want a beer that can be put into a liter boot like this and consumed very quickly and easily and still be enjoyed by your average beer drinker. But the main point of today's video is not just to provide you with a fest beer recipe, but it's also to do some science. We are going to conduct an experiment here that is going to compare two very different brewing techniques, two very different fermentation techniques that are centered around lager production. So today's beer is going to be a 10 gallon recipe. It's going to be a 10 gallon batch. We're going to cut that in half and make two five gallon fermentations out of it. They're both going to receive the same lager yeast. However, one is going to be pressure fermented and one is going to be fermented traditionally at a typical lager temperature. Once we're finished with this, we're going to package both of them up, compare them head to head and see, is there really a difference? Can you get away with pressure fermentation on a fest beer? And is it going to be just as good as doing it the good old fashioned way? Hey guys, it's me from the future. So uh, yeah, that little science experiment kind of failed and I'm just not going to waste your guys time or try to clickbait you into something that's not actually true. So I went ahead, I brewed my 10 gallon batch. Everything went fine all throughout the brew day up until I pitched my yeast. And it was at that point where something was wrong. You see, I waited overnight for the wort to cool down to pitching temperature for both the lager that was going to ferment naturally and the lager that I was going to ferment under pressure. I pitched both yeasts at the same time with my regular lager batch. I pitched my yeast no problem. That was fine. That batch turned out great. And that's what this video is going to be about. <laughs> you see, when I went to pitch my yeast into my pressurized fermenter, I took the lid off and I noticed something very, very interesting. There was already a Krausen on the beer. Less than 12 hours after I brewed the beer, I looked into the beer, sniffed it, didn't seem like anything was off, so I didn't feel like it was an infection. My best guess is that it's instead a persistence of Lutrikevike that somehow missed my entire cleaning procedure. I usually clean with hot PBW and follow up with sanitation right after in the entire volume, but I didn't take all of my valves apart. I don't always do that. And I think what happened was this time was a little bit of Lutra that got stuck in a corner somewhere, and that's all it took for a Krausen to form on the beer. Uh, and that's all it took to take over that fermentation. The other thing too that happened was I accidentally plugged the wrong plug in and I actually plugged my heating pad directly into the wall socket, not into the uh, temperature controller. The temperature controller wasn't even plugged in. So we ended up with, uh, I think, 106 degrees when I went down to pitch the yeast, uh, which explains why the Kvike took off so quickly and why um, it is the way it is. Now, unfortunately, the pitch rate for the Lutra Kvike was not good enough, um, and we have some seriously nasty fusel alcohols in there, despite fermenting the whole thing under pressure. Uh, and the beer is just absolutely terrible. I had to dump it completely. So the rest of this video is about how to make a good fest beer. It's still going to be in the 10 gallon size, but we're just going to show you how to make a good fest beer because the lager batch turned out awesome. And I want you guys to see that anyway. We will carry on our science experiment with pressure versus non-pressurized lagers at another time in the future. So it will still happen. Stay tuned for that. But this video is just going to be a regular old fest beer brew. I hope you guys still enjoy. I understand if you want to click off. Before we jump into the recipe though, I want to make a few shout outs to a few organizations for helping make this video possible. Firstly, Northern Brewer, they are experiencing some shipping difficulties right now. I am well aware I've heard you guys talk. They are short staffed. They're trying to work through that problem, but they are a great place to go find ingredients and equipment and knowledge as well. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply, they make the system that I've been brewing on for the last year and a half now, and it's a great system, both 120 volt and 240 volt, both 10 and 20 gallon options uh, for your electric brew house. Check out their YouTube channel as well for some more entertainment. Once again, this recipe is for a 10 gallon batch. So if you want to brew a five gallon version of this, no worries. Just cut everything in half. 
So for our recipe, we're gonna be targeting a beer that's about the same original gravity as this Meritzen was, about 1059. However, the grist is a lot less complicated than the Meritzen was. So we're starting out with 18 pounds of Weyermann Bark Pilsner Malt, one of my favorite Pilsner Malts, most flavorful one I think that they have outside of Floor Malted Bohemian Pilsner. That's a little bit better, but uh, Bark Pils is great uh, for a beer like this. Secondly, we're gonna add four and a half pounds of Munich Malt. This is the light Munich Malt, followed by two pounds of Melanoidin Malt. Melanoidin malt is a great way to get the character of a decoction mash, which is a, uh, an old school German brewing technique. Decoction mash builds up lots of rich malty flavors in the beer. It takes several hours to do, and it's, it's usually worth the effort. But today I'm trying to do this a bit quicker, so we're gonna skip the decoction, we're gonna do a step mash instead. Uh, but the melanoidin malt really does help provide authenticity of flavor and uh, it, it, it does make a big difference, so I do recommend including it. For our hops, we're gonna be using all Haller Tower Mittelfrü, uh, which is a traditional German hop. 4% alpha acid for all of it. Interestingly enough, we're gonna be focusing on late boil additions for this brew, so the first hop edition is actually at 30 minutes. It's a 60 minute boil, can be longer if you want it to be, but uh, the first hop edition should be at 30 minutes with uh, three ounces of Hallertau Mittelfrühe, and uh, we're gonna follow up at 10 minutes with two ounces of Hallertau Mittelfrühe. So when I was brewing this Märzen, I elected to actually skip water profile additions in general and just use plain old spring water. But as I'm drinking this and I'm thinking about it, I want a little bit more um, minerality in it. I want a little bit more of a water profile to back up some of these deeper, richer flavors with. So as a result, we're adding some water profile adjustments to this beer. I will be starting out with 16 gallons of spring water like I did for the Manson. However, I'm adding some stuff to it. So the target water profile is 38 parts per million of calcium, three parts per million of magnesium, 26 parts per million of sodium, 80 parts per million of chloride, 49 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. My intended goal with this water profile is to keep it from being too soft and to bring out some of that maltiness. In order to get that water profile, I'm adding to the 16 gallons of spring water, four grams of gypsum, two grams of epsom, four grams of sodium chloride, and five grams of calcium chloride. That should get us there pretty easily. For the yeast in this batch, we're gonna be using the same lager yeast that I used in the last batch, um, which performed very, very well. Diamond lager yeast from Lalamand. I'm adding a packet to each fermentation. So for the mash, unlike this Märzen, which was a single infusion rest, this is going to be a step mash. Specifically, we'll be following the Hochkurtz method, which is a traditional German step mash. So we're doing a 30 minute rest at 146 Fahrenheit. This is to control the fermentability of the wort. And then we're gonna step it up to 160 Fahrenheit for about 45 minutes. That breast is going to influence the body of the beer and it's also going to really ensure that we have a very solid head and head retention on the beer. It's important for presentation. And then lastly, we'll mash out at 170 and uh, continue on towards our boil. So that's it folks, let's jump into the brew day. I added 16 gallons of spring water to my 20 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply system and started to heat it up to the mash temperature of the first rest, which was 146 degrees Fahrenheit. I also milled out my grain and measured out my water salts and added all those at this time as the water was heating up. Once the water finally reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in at that first rest temperature of 146 and started to recirculate the mash. After 10 minutes, I saw a pH reading of 5.46, which was actually right on target. So I didn't add any lactic acid or anything to correct for pH. Once the mash had rested at 146 for 30 minutes, I raised it up to 160 for 45 minutes. And then lastly, I raised it up to the mash out step of 170 and let it rest there 
for about 15 minutes. This step is optional, but helps the grain basket drain a little bit easier in my experience. After the mash out was complete, I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for 15 minutes, but also set the controller to maintain a temperature just below boiling so that we didn't have a boil over while the grain basket was draining. Once the basket was finished draining, I removed the basket and set the controller to about 80% power, which is just enough to get a good rolling boil going on the 240 volt 20 gallon system. At this time, I started my boil timer for an hour and I did nothing for the first 30 minutes though. 30 minutes into the boil, I added my first top addition, which was three ounces of Hallertau Mittelfrühe. I let the boil continue for 20 more minutes, and then at the 10 minute mark, I added my 10 minute hop addition, which was two ounces of Hallertau Mittelfrühe. I also added in a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient as well at this time. 10 minutes later, I ended the boil and began to chill the wort down. I transferred into the fermenter as cold as I could get at this time of year, which is only about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. I took an OG sample using the Easy Dense, and I saw an original gravity of 1057, which was really not very far off the goal of 1059 at all. I split the wort into two five gallon batches, one going into my anvil bucket fermenter for a regular lager fermentation in my fermentation chamber, and one going into the Spike CF5 for a hypothetical pressure fermentation. I let the wort chill down overnight to the roughly 60 degree pitching temperature I wanted for both lager yeasts. Once I came back in the morning, I pitched one packet of diamond lager into each batch and left them to ferment in their respective states. However, as I explained earlier, the batch in the Spike CF5 seemed to already be fermenting with possibly a persistent Lutra Kvik fermentation, so we actually waited until I got that one under control to pitch lager yeast to really no avail, uh, and I ended up dumping that batch. But the Anvil Bucket Fermenter batch, the traditional lager, turned out beautifully, and that is what this beer is all about. So to ferment this beer, just like before, I'm gonna actually start with what I'm actually doing and then follow up with some alternative methods and options. Just gonna go directly into my fermentation chamber. It's gonna sit at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm gonna pitch the lager yeast into it, let it naturally ferment, probably raise it up towards about 59 degrees over the course of the fermentation, bring it out of the uh, fermentation chamber once it's about 70 to 80% attenuated, bring it up to 72 degrees for a diacetyl rest, and then finally keg it. So this will take a couple weeks um, to actually go through the entire process. Now, if you're looking for just a regular beer recipe, there's some alternative options you can use. Firstly though, I would highly recommend using a Bavarian lager yeast, not a Bohemian lager yeast. There's a slight difference there. A Bohemian lager yeast is what you traditionally use to ferment a Pilsner. They're gonna attenuate further and consume more sugars, but you want a little bit of residual sweetness on this beer specifically, uh, so I do recommend using a Bavarian lager yeast. For a great example of that is Y Yeast 2206, one of my favorites. Now I'm electing to use Lalaman Diamond Lager Yeast, which is a dry lager yeast, but you can also use W3470 if you want a dry lager yeast as well. Again, that's a bohemian lager, so just pay attention to that. Maybe raise your mash temperature a little bit if you're trying to counteract that attenuation. Now there's another option here, which I'd used uh, with this Meriton and also with a Pilsner that I just brewed, and that is using Lutra Kvike, which is another great option. Lutra is a special kind of yeast that can ferment very, very cleanly at very high temperatures. Lutra can make a beer that is very, very similar to a lager, we'll call it a pseudo lager, in about three to five days of fermentation at about 95 degrees. And it's remarkable what it can do. This may be one of the best options for you if you don't have the ability to pressure ferment or you don't have the ability to control your temperature and you live in a very hot climate. It's a great way to get good beers. Uh, just be sure you're increasing your mash pH a little bit to counteract the Kvike pH drop. If you wanna learn more about that, please check out the video I did on this Meritzen. That should about cover it. If you guys have any questions about fermentation, something I didn't cover, drop it in the comments section and I'll get back to you. So since the pressurized fermentation really wasn't a success, I'm not gonna talk about it here, but the non-pressurized fermentation certainly was. It took about 11 days to reach the final gravity of 1011, 
bringing us into about 6.1% ABV. After this point, I took it out of the fermentation chamber and let it sit at an ambient room temperature of about 68 degrees Fahrenheit for approximately three to five days for a diacetyl rest to allow it to just continue cleaning up flavors. Uh, this is definitely a good step to include with your lagers, especially if they're also a little sulfury because it tends to clean up that part as well. Once this rest was completed, I went ahead and I kegged it, and I also added cold side findings to help accelerate the lagering process. I threw it in my kegerator at about 33 degrees for a couple days, and then as I saw the yeast had finally dropped out of suspension and the beer is pouring crystal clear, I got it ready to pour, and here we are. The beer is called Hit Me With Your Fest Shot, and it comes in at 6.1% ABV, and approximately 21 IBUs. All right, so for the appearance of the beer, it's this gorgeous dark gold color, um, almost orange, but not quite. It has a really nice character in the light right now, especially in this dimpled Maskrug uh, glass here. It is absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's pretty much crystal clear. Pours with a really nice white head with some nice tight bubbles on it. Good structure, good lacing. Uh, head disappears rather quickly though, and it does maintain a good layer on the surface. Uh, as far as the color goes though, it's a little on the dark side for a Fest beer. So. Um, unsurprisingly, the massive amount of melanoid malt that I added into this really darkened this quite a bit. That's okay though, because it falls right at the edge of the spectrum in terms of what a good fest beer color is supposed to be. All right, so now moving in for aroma. The aroma on this one is mostly malt, but there's some really nice hop accents in here, uh, especially from those late boil hops that I added in. It's, it's earthy, it's floral. Yeah, earthy and floral for the most part. The Hallertown Mittelfru are coming through every single time in that really pleasant way. There's a lot of sweet biscuity honey malt on, in there as well uh, that comes across in the aroma. It's actually a pretty powerful aroma. Uh, but now, let's go in for mouthfeel. So the mouthfeel is a bit on the full side, actually. Um, <laughs> I'd say it's medium full. Uh, a little bit fuller than I would have liked, but still definitely drinkable, still definitely something you can down by the liter if you wish. As I complained earlier about the merits in Oktoberfest, that was a little light feeling. This has definitely corrected that issue. The extra minerals in here give this a slight edge, and it really helps the crispiness of it come out and be accentuated. It helps really bolster the flavor as well, because the flavor is really pretty good. And on that note, why don't we go in and talk about that flavor? So right up front, this is a very, very malty lager. Um, as some of you who saw my Instagram post prior to this video noted, uh, yeah, 8% melanoidin malt is a lot of melanoidin malt. Uh, generally, people want to keep it at 8% or less, and most people don't go over five, and I wanted to see what would happen, really, just, just out of curiosity. If I jumped on the uh, heavy melanoidin malt train, and this is what happens, you get a very full-bodied lager that is extremely malty, very, very tasty, don't get me wrong, um, but not necessarily the right mouthfeel for the style. I mean, said, the flavor is absolutely amazing. Um, it is so full of rich, bready, malty, honey-like character. Um, tons and tons of biscuit. This is like a Hellas on steroids. It is so delicious. Even though it finished at the same final gravity as the Meritzen did, it actually has that residual sweetness and fullness due to that extra melanoid malt and due to the lager yeast that I used. Overall, though, it is really pretty good. So don't take that nitpicking at the melanoid malt to being something uh, terrible. It's really just a minor, minor complaint, really. There's a really beautiful hop flavor coming through in this as well. It's hop flavor, not hop bitterness. It has a very, very nice floral, spicy flavor. And just Hallertau Mittelfruh sings on top of a very, very malty beer like this. It comes through so nicely. It's, um, it needs a little bitterness, in my opinion. There's a slight edge of diacetyl in this. Uh, it's noticeable. It's technically allowable in the style, but it's noticeable for me, and I'm not a huge fan of that. However, it does add to the 
kind of more classic lager profile, I suppose, that you might expect out of this. There's no sulfur uh, this time. So overall, I really do enjoy this beer. It's a shame we don't have 10 gallons of it instead of just the five, because uh, I think the pressure fermented version of it probably would have been really good. Uh, but we'll just have to wait for another time to do that. I'm thinking about doing a pressure versus non-pressurized lager fermentation in something like maybe a Czech lager um, to see how, how well that works. So for potential improvements on this one, overall the flavors are pretty much right on point. The only gripes I really have are just the fuller body and the rich maltiness is a little much perhaps for some people. Not for me, but for some, it would definitely be overpowering. And secondly, there is just that little touch of diacetyl in there. I think it just needed a tiny bit longer in the fermenter because it came out once it got colder uh, and it wasn't there in the fermenter. Unfortunately, sometimes that does happen. I did rush it a little bit, so that's kind of on me. But hey, it's still a great beer and uh, really definitely very enjoyable. Still, surprisingly, quite drinkable. As you can tell, it doesn't take very long to get through a half liter. It's really heavy on the biscuity, honey-like character, and that's one of my favorite types of beer flavors overall. So uh, definitely a big win there. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something from it. I hope it made your Oktoberfest a little bit more successful, and I hope it leads to you brewing a great Munich Fest beer of your own. If you wouldn't mind, please go ahead, hit that like and subscribe button if you haven't already and comment down below with your thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, anything you wanna share down in the comment section. I do like to read it all. So if you wanna help support the channel, great way to do that is to pick up some merchandise through my merch store, which is in the description box. Also check out the Patreon, check out the channel memberships. And if you feel inclined, hit that super thanks button. I really do appreciate all of those things. I also have an Amazon store, which you can find in the description box as well. If you wanna check out some of the gear that I recommend. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also available on Facebook and Instagram. So go ahead and check those links out uh, for some more frequent content. Last but certainly not least, if you are still here, well, thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. I know it wasn't quite what some of you expected it would be, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless and got a good Fespia recipe out of it. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching all the way to the end. And as always, this one goes out to you guys who are still here. So until the next one, Prost.